Hello everybody, this is Yiji and welcome back to Project Espa. In this series of videos, I walk you through my process of world building my world Espa, with today's focus being on adding the first planet of my star, Ojor. So get comfy and let's dive in. Okay, so last video we made an orbital planning for the planets that will orbit my primary star. Calculating distances, eccentricities and inclinations, we made eight geologically stable orbits, all of which now need to be filled with a planet. We're gonna get started on that today with our innermost orbit, working our way out over the following videos. So with that established, let's get our first planet in orbit. I think Akundor is the oldest planet of the Ojoran system, lore-wise, having been in there since the 2013 versions. While some of the other planets got added later or revamped, if you go back to the oldest versions of the project, Akundor will be there in more or less the same shape, having been a small lava planet from basically its day of conception. Now, that idea came to me very early when I was watching the 2011 Earth The Making of a Planet documentary and seeing the young proto-Earth. So I probably went something like, hey, that's cool, let's put that in our system. I think the only thing that I've really tweaked over the versions is its precise orbit. As my understanding of orbital rules increased, I have updated it several times to accommodate the concept. But that concept itself has been really consistent, which I guess just indicates how I'm really happy with the concept of it. Can't blame myself, lava planets when done right are hot as heck. So Akundor is the innermost planet of the Ojoran system, with it being over five times closer to Ojor than Mercury is to our sun, and I want that to show. Akundor should be a lava planet, and no, not just Io or Mustafar level, because those aren't even proper lava planets. I'm talking straight up magma oceans across the entire surface. To achieve this would be a monumental task though, but let's try. It would probably be best to avoid the planet getting one-to-one -one tidally locked to its star, so that heat can be spread across the planet evenly, and one side would not be much cooler. This, however, could be tricky, as the planet will also need to be very close to its star to receive enough heat to melt portions of the surface in the first place. So then, a molten ball of lava that's not tidally locked. That's not super restrictive, but will still provide us some challenges to work around. First and foremost that our planet needs to be close enough to melt its surface, but far enough to avoid a tidal lock after 5.8 billion years in orbit. It's not a captured rogue planet after all. And while that would be an interesting workaround to this problem, it would open a whole lot of other issues. So let's not go this direction. To melt the surface it also needs to be very hot and having an atmosphere will help a lot with that, as the atmosphere is an excellent way to retain more heat, so then it needs enough mass to hold onto one also. But this one is also tricky, as the planet needs high gravity to hold onto gases, but the higher temperatures will also cause the gases to expand and escape more easily, which is a major obstacle given the planet's large age. All with all, while the concept of Akundor is simple, I need to strike a good balance between all of these factors to achieve realism with it. First things first, let's take on the mass and size for the planet, for which let's go heavy and tiny. Older versions of this planet were truly tiny, but given our considerations, let's go for something around the size of Mars, but much more massive. Now we can't just design values here randomly, but it would be easy to say Akundra would have 6 Earth masses and call it done, that destroys any sense of realism. So for a terrestrial lava planet, a high mass helps, but we need to stay terrestrial, so our main factor we need to consider here is density. For the most part, terrestrial planets will have densities between 3 and I'd say 7 or 8 grams per cubic centimeter. While there are terrestrial planets such as K238b that go far beyond that, this is typically indicative of unusual formation processes, not something that applies here, because that will present ramifications to the other planets in turn. So all this considered, our lava planet should be dense, but not unreasonably so. So let's aim for that approximate high line of 8 grams per cubic centimeter. Mass over volume gives us the planet's density, through this formula. 
For planets, I like using grams per cubic centimeter. I know that's not as high, but it will be most useful to compare to the solar system. Let's say we give our lava planet a diameter of over 6000 kilometers and a density of 7.7 .7 grams per cubic centimeter. We can grab a mass from that that checks out at 0.157 Earth masses. Again, adding some extra digits here just to make it feel more realistic. To be clear, this is a chunker of a planet, achieving two thirds of the Earth's gravity at just half of its size. We can then calculate its surface gravity as follows, which gives us 6.6 .6 meters per second squared, or expressed as a fraction of the Earth's gravity, 0.676 g's. Okay, so with those established, let's talk orbit and rotation. You will notice that I left orbital periods from our orbital plan last episode. That's not only because those are linked to the mass of the body in orbit, but also our plan isn't super strict here, because of cases like this where we might need to slightly move or otherwise tweak the orbit. If you remember, last video our innermost orbit skips two potential other orbits. So we will have plenty of space to do just that and move from our set distance of 0.11 AU, all done intentionally after having struggled not planning these things in earlier versions of course. And to move we absolutely will, because at its current distance Akundar will struggle a lot to warm enough to melt rock. The best way to solve that is to simply move it closer to our star. But I don't want this planet one to one tightly locked, so we have a hard limit on how close it can be to our star before that starts starts to happen. Using this monstrosity of a formula, we can determine the minimal distance of the planet to its star to avoid a 1 to 1 tidal lock if we know its age. Solving this, we can find that Akundar can avoid a 1 to 1 tidal lock with a given age of 5.8 billion years as long as its orbit stays beyond 0.037 astronomical units from its parent star. Now this is really close. Not something we haven't observed with various exoplanets, but definitely something that would need further explaining. But fortunately, we have a little leeway here. Estimating temperatures is difficult to do as an exact process, because it depends on various factors and can thus vary widely across the planet's surface. A very rough estimate can be given by this formula, which does not account for any atmosphere, internal heating, or any of the other factors you really should be accounting for. That said, it will give us a helpful baseline. Now, since this is a lava planet, we can simply use the albedo for lava and superheated rock, which are both very low. This is due to lava's composition and surface properties. The dark color and rough texture of lava causing it to absorb most of the incoming light rather than reflect it. So lava planets like Akundor are expected to appear very dark when observed from space, probably having an albedo as low as 0.1. The luminosity of Ojor is 57% that of the Sun, which converts to 219 septillion watts, and Akundor's new distance to Ojor is 0 0.056. Because 0.11 AU is still much too cold, reaching a temperature at best of 450 degrees Celsius. This is hot, but far from sufficient, so let's move its orbit inwards. This to help us increase the temperature to about 730 degrees, which is the bare minimum to melt some of the surface rock. But not all. I'd imagine this planet could still hold on to sizable patches of crust. At this stage, Akundar would likely have large lava fields and blackened rocks, but not be molten completely. 730 degrees is also not too far from the Draper point, which starts at about 800 degrees Celsius. At this temperature, most materials will be heated enough to start emitting thermal radiation in the visible light. Like how metals will start glowing red when superheated. Rocks on a Kundor could do the same if we can get the temperature to be above that. Fortunately, we do have one other card to play here though, that will contribute some degrees to Akundor's total temperature, that being the atmosphere. Specifically, the greenhouse effect created by it. Calculating any precise number of degrees for greenhouse heating is going to be incredibly difficult, as there aren't really any practical formulas for it that we could easily apply here. Accurate calculations would require complex climate models that account for various factors such as atmospheric circulation, cloud cover, and feedback loops. None of those I'm really looking to dive deep into as this script is already getting quite long. Instead, we'll have to try and make our best estimate. 
And to do that, let's try and get a decent idea of what kind of atmosphere this planet has, starting with its composition. Using models of the young Earth's atmosphere, as well as those of known lava planets, Akunda will likely have a hot atmosphere predominantly consisting of volcanic gases like carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, nitrogen and water vapor. We can be pretty flexible with percentages here, but some considerations are that CO2, while a great greenhouse gas, will easily break down in carbon monoxide at such high temperatures. While this gas is unstable on Earth, it would likely be much more prominent on a lava planet. CO2 would definitely still exist in large proportions though, but there would be no methane at all, as it would break down completely under the high temperatures. But there also wouldn't be any silicon compounds around, as the planet is still far too cold for that as well. Next is atmospheric pressure, which would likely be much lower than it is on Earth due to my previous stated reasons of hot gases escaping much more easily into space, which given Akundra's age will have resulted in significant loss of atmosphere, though not all atmosphere. You see, hot planets, especially ones with large amounts of tidal friction, continuously replenish their atmosphere through volcanic interaction. A great example of this in reality is Jupiter's moon Io, which experiences massive volcanism due to tidal forces, which allows it to replenish its atmosphere. Now, Io is small and light, but a Kundor is bigger and a lot more massive. So this takes some constraints off of how much the atmosphere a Kundor could hold onto, but not all. So just estimating it, maybe let's aim for something like 0.06 ATMs, which could actually still be on the higher end of what would be realistic. But I have a fix for that as well, so don't worry. How the greenhouse effect works is that certain gases such as carbon dioxide and water vapor are transparent for visible light, but opaque for the infrared wavelengths of thermal radiation. This allows these gases to recapture heat emitted by the planet and then radiate it off in such a way that much is reabsorbed by the planet. Rather than directly heating the planet, this patches heat dissipation of the planet. And there is a lot of heat to dissipate on a Kundor. So I'm guesstimating the greenhouse effect here could total out anywhere between 25 to 150 degrees extra. Let's stick to the higher end of that and heat a Kundor an extra 130 degrees through the greenhouse effect. So its ambient surface temperature raises to 865 degrees Celsius. Very hot, but I've definitely taken some liberty with that number. There are more factors at play in heating a planet, but those will at most add another 5 or 10 degrees. The star and atmosphere do the bulk of it here, together getting our planet comfortably past the Draper point, meaning the rocks at the surface will glow a deep red from the heat. And while this is not enough to melt it completely, a large part of it will definitely melt. So let's say the surface is about 60% lava and 40% solid glowing rock. Lava sees the size of the Mediterranean covering the surface. So that just leaves us some final fixes. As I said before, I don't want Akundur to achieve a tidal lock, but tidal forces on a planet this close to its star are still going to be massive. So if we don't do a tidal lock, we should at least address these with a spin orbit resonance. For those of you who watched my Mercury video, you know all about that. If you haven't though, I'll put an info card on the screen so you can watch that after this one. Let's say for Akundur, its orbit and rotation will resonate 3 to 2, meaning that just like Mercury, for every two orbits the planet will rotate three times. The way this works is that tides resonate with simple multiples. Once a Kundar settles in an orbit like this, it can remain so stably for billions of years. The orbit's eccentricity also plays a role in shifting the tidal lock away from a 1 to 1 ratio towards other ratios such as 3 to 2, like what we saw with Mercury. We can calculate the exact orbital period of our lava planet using Kepler's third law. This means that Kundor orbits every 5 days, 8 hours and 48 minutes. And since its rotation resonates, we can calculate its day to be 2 thirds of its year length, at 3 days, 13 hours and 52 minutes. This does put Akundur in a position where its days are almost as long as its years, but hey, sometimes that's just how life treats you. One last note on its orbit now that we have moved it closer, is that there is now a massive empty gap between Akundur's orbit and that of the next planet over. Akundur is also well within where the inner boundary of the protoplanetary disk would have been, so you think you can see where I'm going with this. Let's say Akundur formed further out and as time passed moved further inwards. This is not super weird for planets to do, and it's quite okay for Akundur to do it, being the innermost planet. Putting the planet in a decaying orbit helps here, because if the planet in the past was further out, and not that hot, it would help explain why it still has that much of an atmosphere, despite its age. 
and having formed further out would also help explain why it's relatively massive. Depending on how much it decayed, we could even fill the gap with another orbit. I'll need to think about that one though. Let me know in the comments I guess if you'd like me to add another planet there or not. For now though, I'm going to purposefully not specify its rate of orbital decay. A little note on why I do that has to do with our shot realism. If I did specify how fast or slow its orbit is decaying, then you'd know exactly when it was where, and the most likely outcome of that would be that our unlikely atmosphere can't exist. This is one of the crucial parts of soft realism, knowing when to stop world building and let imagination take over from the math. Akundor is the first planet of the Ojoran system. It's a small, rocky planet orbiting Ojor at a distance of 8.5 million kilometers every 5.5 days. Its orbit has some eccentricity, but nothing extreme, and the same goes for its inclination. It's about the size of Mars, but much more massive, and its orbit and rotation resonate 3 to 2. At its close distance to Ochor, the planet experiences tremendous heating, both directly from the star, but also through the greenhouse effect. Combined, these factors have raised the Kundor's ambient temperature to over 860 degrees Celsius, leaving the planet struggling to form a complete solid crust. As such, large parts of the planets are covered by large magma seas, and intensive lava floods cover vast fields, struggling to properly solidify, and made more common by the huge tidal forces. Due to its high ambient temperature being above the Draper point, solid surfaces that do exist perpetually glow a deep red. The planet has a thin atmosphere composed primarily of carbon dioxide, water vapor and nitrogen. Akundor orbits so close to Ojor that it can only be spotted from Espa during the daytime, or close to sunset or sunrise. It has no moons, obviously, and its orbit is slowly decaying, which will eventually result to it falling into Ojor in the distant future. So that brings us to the comment of this episode, which is by Ayus Garden. I'm super excited for the next video. Thank you. The response to this series so far has been absolutely amazing, for which I'm eternally grateful. Some of you who've been following this channel for a bit longer might have some familiarity with the old versions of the Axel system, so you have a rough idea of what's on the menu with this series. Lava planets are absolutely awesome, but as I hope I've demonstrated here, not always very easy to pull off in a hard realism setting, because even though a lava planet is hot, lava is very hot. That may sound redundant, but as you saw today, there is a lot of math that goes into making a scientifically sound planet. Much more even than I've gone over here. There's actually a lot more I could do with Akundor. But this video has gone on long enough already, so for the sake of brevity I will end it here, with the possibility of revisiting and expanding in the future. So make sure you're subscribed if you want to see how this continues, and leave me a comment telling me what you think of Akundor, and if you have any other feedback for me. And as always, thank you so much for watching, and I will see you guys in the next one, where we're going to work out our second planet. Stay tuned.